Uh, introduction. My name is Michele Petocchi and I am the forum leader for uh, uh, university relations and uh, I'm pretty proud of uh, introducing actually uh, three friends today. Uh, two are juridical friends. The first friend is the University of Oxford uh, with which the forum has a great and progressing relationship among the top universities we work with. The second juridical person is the school of 21st century at the University of Oxford, which is at the, it's a school at the forefront of the systemic and topic-specific uh, uh, um, analysis of risks and challenges that the future uh, holds for us. And actually, the physical friend I'm really happy to introduce to you today is Dr. Jan Goldin, who is the director of the 21st Century School at Oxford University. Uh, Jan came to Davos, I was looking at the database, in first time in 1997 at the Winter Davos and he's been one of the most engaged, active and proactive collaborators and, and leaders uh, on the forum platform. So I leave it to you to tell us what the forum holds. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Michele. Let's get... Uh... So one thing we know about the future is that it is very uncertain. The best minds with the greatest institutions get their thinking about the future wrong. This is in technology, where the leaders of great institutions are celebrated to get it wrong. It is in the areas of politics, where MI5, MI6, the great intelligence agencies and leaders of the world habitually get things wrong, uh, as they famously did only three years before Mandela was released. And, of course, more recently we've seen this political failure of future thinking in the US where Obama, a year before he became elected, uh, was unimaginable as a leader. And we certainly see this in finance where we have the most comprehensive system of thinking about the future. We have institutions like the IMF, like the Financial Stability Forum, which were established with the task of understanding and managing global risks. And yet the 20,000 economists employed with that job in mind weren't able to see this coming. So I want to begin my talk about the future by emphasizing how uncertain it is and how important it is not to predict but to think systemically, to think of structural change, to think of the big things that are happening, but don't try and predict because only by luck will you be right. Now the most fundamental force that's driving this and which is informing the reason why it's getting more and more difficult to predict is globalization. Globalization is a wonderful thing. It has brought immense benefits, but we need to appreciate the pace at which it is changing. Note that this is a logarithmic scale of growth of income as population have grown. And so we've had this remarkable experience in the last uh, 40 years, which was only an experience of about a thousand years ago when income has exceeded population growth. And remarkably, this period of about a thousand years ago was a period when societies came together when Islamic and Christian and Judeo societies met, and when East met West, when China and Europe and India came together and there was a spasm of innovation. But that was short-lived. And we've been through such an experience again since about 1980s. The fall of the Berlin Wall, the opening up of China have been a major part of this, but so too have policy changes around the world, including in the areas of macroeconomics and in many other areas. And you see this in the financial flows. This is 1990. This is financial flows to developing countries. About 1990, a structural change, great instability, but very different levels of flows. And associated with these flows are, of course, the flows of ideas that go with the internet, which go with innovation. And it's this innovation, this coming together of people with finance uh, across the world that has led to an explosion of globalization and potential that comes from our creativity around the world. So it's a most exciting and wonderful period in the history of humanity. It's a period which if you stand back and look at this earth over a long view, must be the best period ever to be living. Life expectancy at birth of our generation has increased by over 20 years. It took from the Stone Age to our generation's birth to achieve that. The number of poor people living under a dollar a day has gone down dramatically, despite the world's population increasing by about two billion over this time. 
And the number of illiterate people on Earth has gone down by about a half over this period. And you can look at any different index you wish, and on virtually any of them, except the ones related to the environment, which I will come back to, there's been this leap in improvement. So we live in a golden age. And the key question is, will this continue? Will the 21st century be the period in which we finally eradicate poverty and disease? Will it be the period of eco-affluence, as we may like to think about, or will it be a period of disaster? And this is the key question we face. Now, looking at the future, as I indicated, is unpredictable. And these are simply the UN population projections going out to 2050. We are here at just under 7 billion. And what you see in this is this range of uncertainty. A range of uncertainty of almost 4 billion people looking out only 40 years. That's two-thirds of the population of the planet of uncertainty with enormous consequences for virtually anything we think of. Of course, economic growth and the environment being amongst them. And why is there such uncertainty? There's uncertainty because we don't understand some of the key drivers, particularly of fertility, but also of longevity. And this, if one breaks it down by region, one finds similar sorts of trends, with some regions growing down very good. And I personally am rather, if you want to call it that, optimistic on this front. I think we'll be at the lower end of the projections for the reasons you'll see in a minute. Now, we're very fortunate in Oxford to have an Institute of Aging as part of the 21st Century School. And Professor Sarah Harper in the back is uh, the leader of this institute, which is doing a lot of work on the key drivers of longevity and fertility. And what you see in this is a continual improvement and a convergence in longevity over this period uh, so that we are increasing our ex life expectations by at least two years every decade. And the great news about coming to Dalian, apart from its many other merits, is that I think your life expectancy while here will increase by what? About 90 minutes, I imagine, uh, over these days. So this is the tremendous progress that's happening in the world through technology and through public health and other means. Of course, we won't say that if you'd stayed at home and slept uh, or gone to the beach, your life expectancy would have similarly increased. Your mental capacity has leaped forward as well, which is a tremendous this achievement. Uh, I think these might also be rather conventional numbers for the reasons we'll see in terms of the miracles in medicine. But these are more stable uh, projections and converging projections than the fertility projections. Well, you see a dramatic shift in a very, very short period of time. In one generation, fertility declining dramatically uh, and converging below two in every part of the world except Africa, and in some parts of this region, as we know, much closer to one, including in parts of uh, China, much closer to one, with dramatic consequences for global growth, and not least the fiscal and pensions uh, dependency ratios in public and private uh, groupings, and we'll come back to those in a minute. But this is a convergence and a dramatic one in a very, very, very short space of time on the fertility side, which is likely to continue. And so we get into the question of what aging in the future, and what we see in this graph uh, is the rapid decline in the youth, from about 1980, the rapid increase in the over 60s, and the number of elderly overtaking the number of young uh, in about 20 uh, to 40 years' time, more like 30 years' time. Uh, and this, of course, is something which has dramatic implications around the world. This is Italy, um, and you see over 20, 30, how we move from a population pyramid and the conventional understanding of demographic uh, structures to what some may call a coffin shape. Um, and you wouldn't want to be uh, these people paying for those people. Uh, but equally, you wouldn't want to be these people getting up there worrying about who's going to push you around in your wheelchairs and who is going to pay for your health systems. Uh, and this, of course, is a global story. So dramatic changes demographically around the world. And similarly in China, uh, this goes out to 2050, you see the potential for massive change, moving to a skyscraper, or how my aesthetic colleague Sarah calls it a vase, uh, but this is a healthier structure. Note some of the imbalances on gender going forward. Provinces in China with very significant gender imbalances uh, playing through, and of course the dependency ratios increase for this. So we will very soon be moving to a situation where already we have, sorry, uh, the most people uh, in the world aged, 
will be in, uh, in Asia. And what you see is about 700 million uh, elderly people in Asia. Other regions, of course, also rapid growth, but Asia having more elderly than the rest of the world put together. Very, very dramatic story of demographic change with many social consequences that go for it. One of the questions is, can migration compensate for uh, the elderly? Will we have the migrants to not only enter our workforces, to pay our pensions, to push us around uh, when we're very elderly? And I think the answer is no. Uh, this is the rich countries' labor forces. Uh, you see a decline in the number of workers from about 800 million to about 600 million over this period. And uh, even very major increases in the number of migrants of the scale of about 100 million people uh, wouldn't compensate for this decline in migrants. This is uh, uh, really, in many political terms, difficult to think of. But still, migration has to be a very, very significant part of the story of how one meets these imbalances in the future. Of course, the question will also be, where do the migrants come from? Because the donor countries will be running down their demographics and going through a demographic shift even more quickly than the rich countries by then. So it's not obvious that people want to migrate from the countries that currently they migrate from. Uh, the key question in this region is, will the boom continue? Uh, what can we expect of this region? It's been a region, of course, of the most remarkable change in history. Uh, never before in human history has any part of the world ever grown in this sort of way over a sustained period of time. So this is a totally new human experience, uh, the transformation that's happening here, and one that brings great excitement, but also, of course, many, many other different dimensions. This is work with the World Bank just before I left it, and its projections out to 2030 of economic uh, trends, and you see um, that this was done before the crisis, although I don't think the fundamentals have changed in any significant way around this, and it projects continued average growth rates of around 7% uh, for China, Asia, if still leading, and very tepid, slow growth rates in the rest of the world. So the developing world growing much more rapidly, continually so over into the future, and the rich countries continued slow growth with an optimistic outlook for China over the long term. I'm happy to come back in discussions for the reasons for this. Now, what does this mean when you run the statistics through? What it means is that China very rapidly becomes the biggest economy in the world uh, in uh, GDP terms. This is the historicals. This is China in red along here, already overtaking everyone except the US uh, and um, sorry, the European Union. But that quickly changes when you go through this. This is a continuation of the US line. And depending on the projections that you cast for uh, China, it overtakes the US in somewhere between 2030 and 2050. And again on this, I think we, I'm an optimist for China, and I think it's likely to be closer to 2030. So it becomes the powerhouse with all sorts of implications that we can dis discuss in other uh, areas. When you look at the implications for global shares of GDP, you see the rapid transformation. And this is a share of global product, China moving from around 4% to uh, well over a quarter of global product over this period, and the others commensurately declining uh, because of that. Now, stepping away from economics to think of some of the technological revolutions that are going to drive the future, this is a period of the most remarkable growth, and some have said exponential growth, though I don't like that term, in technologies. And that has a huge upside potential. It's the reason why globalization has moved so rapidly. Containerization, fiber optics, air transport, and all the other tools. But it is also the reason why we are so fragile. And so I'd like to look at a number of these and just give a sense of what's driving in the future. Behind a lot of what we see in technology is the story. It's Moore's law. The ability of uh, computers to increase their capacity by cost uh, about at a double every 18 months. And this has been a rather stable trend over a long period of time since Moore in the 60s uh, figured it out. But he thought it would run out after two generations. The remarkable thing is that when you speak to the people working in this area, they don't see a limit 
to the ability of computing power by price to double about every 18 months because as we begin to run out of our etching capacity on silicon, we move to quantum and other computing. Now what does this mean? Uh, this means that for the same price, you can do the most remarkable things so that my uh, mobile phone is more powerful than the entire Apollo computing system in the 60s. Uh, my son's PlayStation 3 is more powerful than the deep blue computer which beat uh, and challenged Kasparov 11 years ago. So that is what happens when you get this exponential growth and you run it through everything uh, with the most amazing potential. So uh, for a thousand dollars we're about at lizard power now they say. Uh, and we should be at brain capacity in 20 to 40 years time. That is the most speculative of the statements that I will make today because I actually don't believe it either uh, because we don't understand the brain. Uh, but the capacity is doubling by price uh, in this period and this permeates everything and is the opportunity for everything that we do in technological change. One of the things it does of course is this most remarkable story on the internet and web. This is again a logarithmic scale here, billions of gigabytes, the amount of storage, that's what we can have in our brains, about 100 million and then, sorry, 10 million and then what is happening every year. And this is the most remarkable story. So every month now, we are able to reproduce the entire amount of information ever created uh, by mankind in documentation. And this is moving to every day in a couple of years' time. So this is the power of the chip with the information absorption. And the good news is that the storage capacity, our ability to manage this, is growing even more rapidly. That's that line at the top, uh, and you'll know that from going out to buy what used to be a few K of memory stick and is now a few gig for the same price. Uh, and so this is the story which allows us to transfer to tr and to innovate. It's also the reason why uh, societies that are grabbing hold of it, like China, will become the leaders and why it's, China's opening up to the world is so influenced by this. Part of the story is also a story of miniaturization and I'm glad to have here today also Professor John Ryan who leads our nanomedicine group in the 21st century school. This is not a, f a photograph, this is a mock-up because nanomachines don't look like Meccano sets, uh, but it's a sense of scale with a dust mite. Uh, these are billionth of a meter size uh, manipulations and this is uh, again a mock-up simulation of a nano needle going through a cell from John's unit, trying to understand what happens when we get into nanomedicine and go through a cell. And as John will explain, uh, I, or I feel this doesn't look very healthy in terms of what it takes through the cell. Now, of course, nano is already being used. In the UK, you can buy sunscreen off the local pharmacy shops with nano in. And so there's not much of a regulatory and other environment around this. And so part of what we need to understand is what is the health and other implications of these new technologies. And just as in derivatives, we discovered that the machines were giving us time bombs, uh, or some of say weapons of mass destruction, uh, so too may be the case with other technologies. Our ability to understand them is limited. Another very powerful development of the 21st century will be stem cells. And I'm also delighted to have Dr. Paul Fairchild here, who's the director of our Stem Cell Institute. This is a photograph of a cardiac stem cell filmed in Oxford. Uh, from an embryonic cell. The cells which can be made to become any part of the body, direct us. And the revolutions that this will create in terms of the potential for regenerative medicine are beyond our imagination. The sorts of things that allow, as Paul said this morning, a salamander to recreate parts of their body might be things that we can envisage uh, even within our lifetimes. And the ability to direct this towards all forms of regenerative medicine will make it very difficult to think about what we think about now in terms of therapeutic medicine for paraplegic and many other ailments. Even more difficult to get our heads around is what's happening in some of the genetic work. This is uh, a film of two mice. The back one is a wild mice, mouse. The front one is one that's been gen genetically manipulated uh, to become much more effective. It consumes a little bit more food but it can run for six times uh, the, the time of the other mouse. And it can just keep running and keep running for six hours like this. Now you begin to imagine 
What happens when we start genetic manipulation of human beings? It raises enormous questions regarding ethics, regarding equity, and of course regarding access. What it is to be human goes to the very core of this question. But the technologies are developing which allow a transformation for the first time in our history of our very being. We are affected by our upbringings, by our environment, by our nutrition, by our schooling, and many other things to be, have different outcomes. But we believe in a concept of broad equality of humans in their essence. What this allows is thinking about people that are actually hardwired to be superior in some ways and raises many, many deep questions about the future of humanity, about regulation, about competition between companies, countries, and many other areas. And it's an issue we are focusing very deeply on in our institute on bioethics, which brings together bioethicists with medics and biochemists and others. That is one big risk and issue facing us. It's one that's not got much attention, but which is extremely important at the global level. There are the traditional risks which you know about, the pandemic and other risks, which will also affect us in a very deep way. There are things we will do to ourselves, the anthropogenic, and things which nature will do to us. I don't worry about these ones, an asteroid hitting us, whatever. That is a very small risk and I, there's not much we can do about it. These are the ones that are growing very, very rapidly because our potential to destroy ourselves is much greater than before. So the things we worry about are not what I used to worry about before I joined the 21st century school or things like this. Uh, now I worry up there. And this is issues that can affect the very future of civilization. Humanity might survive as a species, but everything we've achieved and this great achievement of globalization is threatened uh, in this process. Now, Lord Martin Rees, who's the president of the Royal Society in England, I think one of the wisest and smartest men in Britain, puts a 50% probability in his book, Our Final Century, on civilization not surviving the 21st century. Let's say he's pessimistic, and it's 5%. It is still extremely important to worry and think about these issues. And the point is that this risk is growing, whatever it is, because of our interdependence, our integration, and our technological capacity, partly liberated by the internet and the communication. This integration and interdependence has led to a systemic risk, which leads to tipping points. Now, one of these graphs is the Great Crash and the other is water boiling, and you difficult to label them because they have similar characteristics. We don't understand them until they've happened and they change. The risks move very rapidly. This is from the World Economic Forum risk reports. And whichever way we look at it, we are unable to predict them. The point is that the long tail is wagging much more aggressively. These very low probability, very high impact events are uh, a cause of increasing concern. Because if there's one of them in one place, it shakes the whole system. And that's what we've seen in the financial crisis, which is the first systemic risk of the 21st century. It had the characteristics of being a result of very rapid globalization, very rapid technological change, and an evolution of ideas which leapfrog way ahead of institutions. And so the institutions that were set up only 10 years ago, the Financial Stability Forum and the IMF, which was set up in an earlier period to manage global risk, didn't even see this thing coming, let alone have an ability to deal with it. So how do we begin to think of these and which are the principal ones? Climate change is obviously one that we've heard a lot about and it's extremely important. I think it will, unfortunately, be a dramatic systemic shock for the system. It will be like a tsunami shock. It comes slowly and then suddenly one sees its effect in a very uh, broad way, a surprising effect, unpredictable. And the scientists know what the average numbers are, and these are the average IPCC projections of temperature change. But there's very little understanding of detail, of tipping points, uh, and of the impact on any one society. Of course, the poor and the vulnerable particularly in Africa, in Asia, are the ones that suffer most from these shocks. And they are the ones uh, that stand the much to lose. China's in a difficult position here. China has a relatively low per capita emission, around two 
uh, tons per capita. It's not up with others, the, some of the other developing countries that you can see there, but it's growing extremely rapidly. And because of its numbers, small per capita numbers aggregate to very, very high total numbers so that it's rapidly becoming the largest carbon emitter on Earth, if it's not already. So it has a dramatically important role to play, and we should discuss some of the things that can be done. Pandemics is another systemic shock. Pandemics will affect us most. Pandemics have always been the biggest killers of humanity. For some reason, we are myopic. And the rather benign, touch wood, results so far of the current pandemic should not give us false hope. This is a lurking and continual threat. And the more integrated we are, the bigger it is. Of course, the really worrying dimension is not so much only natural, but also man-made. Now, the sorts of things we can do, and this is from our Institute on Emergent Infections and Pandemics in the 21st century, is trying to understand how we should respond to a pandemic. What should we do? How do you intervene? And this is an extremely important preventive coordination issue. Bioterrorism, which is the ability of individuals to create a pandemic uh, through DNA synthesizers, through other means, as we've seen a, a hint of in the anthrax scare, is perhaps the most worrying. Because a single individual, a group of individuals, uh, could create absolute havoc uh, in very large parts of the world. So how we detect these things at source, how we isolate them and control them, is a key global priority. I mentioned the bioethical issues associated uh, with bioengineering, with all the other dimensions of the medical miracles, stem cell research, cloning, uh, concentration enhancement, chemicals. There's no part of our body that will be improved. And we will be able to enhance the mind as well. This is interesting data from looking at people that were near highways suffering from lead uh, in the air. And the, what happens when you increase the IQ, a very crude measure of ability, uh, by a small percentage? And the effects in a whole range of areas, including GDP, social behavior, and so on. And what you see is that particularly at the lower end of the spectrum, small changes can lead to very dramatic social incumbents. Now, this is very deeply difficult in terms of ethics and in equity and many other areas. But if we are, do have the ability to increase concentration, to increase intelligence, to increase IQ, if you want, should we use it? And if we don't use it in our companies or in our society, and a competitor does, what will we do? Should there be national regulation? Should there be global regulation around these issues? These are the conversations that corporate and global leaders will be having in Davos's and Dalian's of the future. Very difficult questions about distribution. Also, access to these will be absolutely key. Will these wonderful medical miracles be available on national health services in Africa, or even poor European countries, let alone China, uh, and, of course, the others. Or will it just be that the richest countries become a superhuman race because their people can afford the drugs and the enhancement, but others cannot? Very difficult questions. And equality, of course, a driving risk of society already with this fantastic improvement of globalization, very rapidly widening inequality around the world, which will increase further in the years to come, leading to instability. These lead systemic risks. The integration of these different risks are what concern us. The importance of understanding how one piece connects with the other. It is an extraordinarily complex set of changes that are happening. Enormous potential to bring about a world which our parents could not have dreamed of. But there's also the most extraordinary risk that's associated with it. The underbelly of globalization is fragility. It's that we are more vulnerable than ever before. The upside is that we are more powerful as individuals and as countries to change our lives than ever before. We have to ask ourselves, who's going to make the decisions? Who is going to be having their hands on the steering wheel as we navigate this very complex territory? And to what extent can we trust the institutions which manage the world. Are these institutions, many of which are post-Second World War, which emerged in response to previous crises, the ones that we would trust to deal with the future? And if not, how can we either transform them or create new ones? 
new systems that will lead to a good outcome. I believe this is the most important question. How do we evolve a global management system to meet the 21st century challenges? It's one that's absolutely central to the answer, will this century be our best century? Will we have the wisdom to conquer our fears, our anxieties, to collectively bring a better outcome? Or will it be our worst? The future, I believe, is in our hands, and it really is up to us to put our best minds together to come to a solution which we all can live with, with happiness. Thank you. So we have uh, 25 minutes for discussion. I believe there is a uh, translation to Mandarin, if anyone would like to use that. And uh, I will chair myself. <laughs> Who'd like to go first? I know this is a huge uh, and very broad set of issues in a very short period of time. Yeah. Here in the end, you discuss a number of institutions. Near the end, you discuss a number of possible institutions which we may need to manage the future. Have you thought about the possibility of going the other way? In other words, devolution, uh, a more matrixed form of future. Something like the internet, where yep. perhaps not anarchism, but uh, close. Yes, I mean, the. The interesting thing about the institutions is that finance is the best system we have. We have more people thinking about finance and financial risk than we do about any other risk in the world, except maybe take military out. Um, and we have new institutions like the Financial Stability Forum. And these are very good and technocratic institutions. The IMF is one of the toughest places to get into if you're an economist like I am. So these are not silly people. They all have Harvard PhDs, or Oxford PhDs, or equivalent. And yet none of them saw the crisis, and none of them could manage the, the systemic risks. And so one has to ask oneself for that reason, and for a related reason, that there have been, and I've sat on many of them, institutional reform task forces, which have tried to, for example, reform the Bretton Woods system or the United Nations systems, and they just end up in some political swamp and get put on a shelf. Um, so if we can't reform the institutions, and uh, the, the, the good institutions themselves are very rapidly outdated by globalization and technological change. This is what I ha think happened in the case of the IMF. Um, should we be recommending new institutions or new superstructures, or should we go to a devolutionary structure as you recommend? And I, I think there's a lot of merit in that, um, networked, collective, and some things work very well. I mean, international air traffic control, for example, uh, international meteorological understanding is a, basically a networked system that operates very, very effectively. Postal service is another one. Operates very effectively on network model, a uh, devolved model. Uh, the problem is that when you think of some of these big global challenges like the bioregulation ones or the pandemic or climate change, you need an institution that, is in, that can enforce. You need a referee that when they blow the whistle, all the players listen. And the problem, one of the problems with the IMF has been that the IMF wasn't able to look into the US's kitchen. Um, you need a referee that has the power. And so the question is, how do you get enforcement without institutional form at the top level? Um, and, and, but I think this is a very important debate. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm much less convinced that an international institution is the answer to global problem solving than I was, say, a year ago before the financial crisis. Um, the lady over here? No? Okay. Yeah, sorry, the gentleman over there. Mm. So, so I guess I want to reflect on your first slide versus the many others, the yeah. whole difficulty in predicting the future, and yet you've just shown us a set of technologies where policy and regulation is crucially dependent on our ability to predict the future. Do you see and both an importance and an understanding that must come out of these things with respect to new types of modeling, new types of simulation, new types of analysis. Yeah, it, 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 it is, it is, uh, there is a tension uh, 
that, that I, I'm very concerned that we, that we spend much more time thinking about the future. And to me, it's, it's a very strange contradiction that although the rest of all of our lives will obviously be spent in the future and our societies, when you think about the amount of energy we spend individually, collectively, uh, and especially through our nation states and organizations thinking about it, it's absolutely trivial. You can't find a person to speak to at the World Bank about five years away or ten years away, although the institution is established to create the hardware and software for the long-term future of countries. Uh, and similarly in different governments and, and, and so on. So uh, I think we need much deeper thinking. We especially need to understand the technologies. But I don't think we should kid ourselves that somehow we'll be able to cover all the bases or understand all the options. This thing mutates all the time and we need the agility to keep moving. But if we put more resources into it, we begin to be able to catch up with developments and understand them. We also need to rely much more on young minds. I mean, one of the big things I think that happened in the financial crisis is that we had people like me in the institutions who got their doctorates 30 years ago and thought they knew what was going on. And then you had kids who got their doctorates last year playing the game. Uh, so you had new regulations, as in Basel. And then you just had regulatory arbitrage. People game the system because they're smarter and more up-to-date and have new games and toys, and you don't understand them, let alone uh, have an ability to capture them. So there's a big generational issue, there's a skilling issue that goes along, I think, with this regulation thing. We need renewal at a much more rapid pace of our institutions that regulate. Um, the gentleman next to you and the gentleman at the back. Uh, so I think the, the institutional superstructures is obviously crucial. I also think that there's a question about how individual institutions are chartered because whether it's business or government, we essentially have legal structures that mandate short-term thinking. Doesn't that need to change? Yeah. Well, here we get into a very complex and difficult question. One of the wonderful things about being in China is that you can have real conversations about 5, 10, and 20 years away. And there's a whole system, both in the planning system, but also a technocratically driven leadership that actually has that mandate. Now, I know because I work in the UK, trying to engage the British government, for example, in discussions regarding five years' time is very, very difficult. And you're lucky if you can talk about yesterday's newspaper headlines with them. Um, so this is a, a structural and difficult issue, and I think we might, we, and it's also about the role of civil servants. Civil servants used to be the long-term thinkers. That's one of the, distant, in a democracy, the big differences between the elected government and civil servants. And if you politicize the civil service and rotate it too long and you give it a short-term mandate, you take away that responsibility. So I think there's a big, there are very big implications for how we think about the structures of government, in, particularly uh, in democracies. The gentleman in the back. Thank you. Uh, I'm Timothy Mai, social worker from Hong Kong. I just want to know how do you see in the future about the quality of human relations and also the solidarity of the families because when we're talking about the future, if without family, without the quality of a human being, then what can we see in the future? Yeah. Yeah. One, of, one of the things that I'm struck by is that the more we integrate, the more we are able through our travels and through the web and through Facebook and our other communities to find out about other people, two things happen. The first is we do not lose our national identity. We were all worried with globalization that we'd somehow lose it. The French were worried that people would stop speaking French or eating baguettes or whatever. This has not happened. Uh, national identities, cultural identities have not only remained as strong as they were, many of them being reinforced. For example, the international Armenian community has rediscovered itself through the web. So new communities are rediscovered that actually didn't exist 20 years ago as a result of globalization. The second thing is that people are more international. I know my children have lived in four different countries, that they keep up contacts and networks with their friends around the world in a way that I would have given up on long ago because writing letters was too difficult. Um, and I think it will create a solidarity. There are obviously questions about home uh, work balance. There are big questions about how much time people spend on the internet, uh, Facebook addiction, and all of these sorts of questions. But I'm, I'm not at all pessimistic that these lead to a breakdown of community, identity, or other forms. I think globalization and technological change has actually given us the power to, to balance that with a real globalized uh, citizenship. I'm going to swing to this side of the room quickly uh, and start in the front here. It tends to, we tend to focus too much attention on risks. 
and uncertainty. What about the future looking forward? Like, uh, do we see any bright future? What are we should be hopeful for? And what should we be looking forward to? And uh, what's going to be like bright side of the future? Yeah, I think that's good. I, when we structured the 21st century school, we tried to balance between the upside and the downside, and both are equally important. I think what we can look forward to in the century is a cure for cures for cancer. Uh, I think Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are going to be much more difficult because we don't understand the brain well enough. Um, I think uh, I, I've said it before and I'm at risk of uh, getting into trouble for it, but I don't think that uh, we're going to have a uh, Paralympics, for example, in 2050. Uh, because I think stem cell and other developments would have allowed young people the ability to overcome many of the challenges. We might still have many other forms of things going on, particularly for the elderly. Um, I think that we will, I hope, have the ability to put our wisdom together with our resources to overcome poverty. I can imagine a world of eco-affluence where we all do what we love doing, whether it be listening to music, playing golf, or whatever really is important because our tools and our technologies would have given us the resources and ability to do that. So I think there's a huge upside and it's that that we, that we have to manage the risks to make sure they don't get those off track. Yeah. Hello, my name is Piros Makridakis, I'm a professor at INSEAD. And you saw a very interesting graph about the evolution of artificial intelligence and how it doubles, or how the power of computers doubles every two years. There are a lot, as you know, of uh, predictions that artificial intelligence would approach that of the human brain in some like 15 yep. years, and by 2050, it's going to be higher than all of the humans together. For me, this seems like a very big danger. Yep. Maybe you, I would like to yeah. hear your opinion about this. Yeah. Um, Ray Kurzweil uh, and his idea of the singularity has famously popularized these sorts of concepts. I said when I was talking about the projections, I think these are the most uncertain. Uh, I don't actually believe in that concept at the moment. I think it's likely to happen at some point in the future that we will have an artificial intelligence which is more powerful than ours. But our, the, the complexity associated, the trillions of connections in our brains associated with the way we are as individuals, our emotions, our experience, I find it difficult to think that that will be synthesized. Um, so we, we might have the Hal uh, Kubrick sort of scenarios where they can do uh, things like turn us off. Um, but uh, in terms of the completeness of being, I, I think it's difficult because I think we will always have the power to pull the plug. Uh, so um, that, that is going to be a power. But I think it, it, this, is, this is, you know, obviously where it's driving and the sort of things like wireless internet connectivity for the brain will come. Uh, I'm pretty sure of that. And what power that will unleash. Uh, memory obviously becomes less important. Uh, what becomes important is analysis, ability to synthesize. Uh, so uh, all of these uh, changes will happen. I think 2050 is too soon. Uh, but uh, but uh, yeah, if you, if you, I, I think we, we, we're on a path to changing the way we are in a structural way which has not happened in any previous century. I do think that, and, but the first things will be the, the medical miracles, the STEM, nano, and other related, I think. Um, yeah. Um, when you showed the graph, or when you um, talked about Martin Rees giving us only 50% to survive the century, um, I, I remember when we talked about it at some point, I'm Andrew Wilkins from Mercato Foundation in Germany, um, that we seemed as mankind to need to, to reach the tipping point before we actually do something. And yeah. that may be okay to certain, uh, to certain things, wars, um, maybe, um, maybe even financial crisis, but when it comes to climate change, yeah. if we reach the tipping point, then it's too late. How do you see that going forward? Can mankind actually do something before it reaches a tipping point? Yeah. I think that's the key question. Can we uh, manage risk proactively or are we only reactive as human beings? And the, the, the difficult thing when one looks at the evolutionary history of institutions is they tend to be reactive. Out of the ashes of various crises come new, new forms of global structure. Uh, I hope that we are 
through this incredible technological and other power and the interconnectedness that's leading us to realize that we are so interdependent. Uh, I hope we're reaching a higher stage of evolution in terms of our ability to form institutions. But politics seems just as primitive as it did 200 years ago to me. Uh, the nation state, the proliferation of nation states. It's difficult to look at the world now and think that it's any more sophisticated than it was. Uh, in the major revolutions, the end of the Cold War uh, being one of them, which have made new things possible. And I think the rise of China is very healthy as well in this respect. But um, I suppose what can, one can hope for is small crises that lead to big changes. And one of the things about the financial crisis that um, I, I don't want to be misquoted here, but I fear is that actually it might not have been big enough in terms of its institutional shock and change that it generated. And that we get the rebound now, we get a complacency, we do not get the structural changes which are required and the deep understanding of financial risk which is required for a new institutional structure. And so it's not just the size of the shock, but it's how it's interpreted and what happens after it that really matters. And I think that's very important. One more question here and then we'll bounce back to this side. Yeah, the gentleman there. Oh, okay, you there? All right. <laughs> so, uh, if I heard correctly, we said in 2050 he won't have any more um, Paralympics, is that right? Sorry? If I, if I heard correctly, you said in 2050 or 2060, it doesn't matter, he won't have any more Paralympic Games because there will be no, will be no more disabled people on Earth. More? No. More, more disabled people. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, yeah. 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 I think this is an uh, uh, unbearable statement. You know, we have actually around one billion people who are disabled. And if you say, okay, that, uh, you know what, the consequence is, is quite pretty tough because I think in a way uh, you, you think that uh, being disabled is not, let's say, a, a matter of, of life or it's not, uh, let's say, it's not, it's not the future. And in my understanding, I think future starts today, you know, yep. and we have to respect the situation of everybody. Yep. And I wish, I think, that we don't make such statements that you, let's say, uh, let's say uh, don't uh, accept the, the living, yep. uh, let's say, uh, conditions of, of disabled yep. people. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate your point very much, and I'm glad you made it. I understand what you're saying, and it, I in no way meant to say that I regard disabled people as inferior or shouldn't have a future or shouldn't be born. I just think that uh, I'm... Firstly, these games tend to be amongst very young people in their teens, twenties and so on. Uh, and that the sorts of technological revolutions that will be happening in the, in the 2030s and 2040s, which would be the time when people who would maybe be competing in the 2050s uh, would be born, will mean that there's going to be a whole range of different ways of dealing with many of the things that have caused disabilities now. Now, it's a different question to say, do people out of choice want to be disabled? Uh, and that I respect, and there might well be. Uh, that and there could well be all sorts of things around that. I'm aware of Supreme Court actions going on at the moment in the US around this very issue. But that's a very complicated and difficult debate. And I think you're right. There may well be those sorts of games. But I don't think they'll be, they will not be thought of and be in exactly the same way as we think about them today. I think the options will be very different in 2015 to which they are now. I'll be happy to chat with you about it afterwards. Okay, uh, the gentleman here. Yeah, microphone. Thank you. Um, a lot of the um, analysis, obviously, it's based on uh, statistics and economic information and so on. Um, the rise of extremist ideologies and so on, you, you, I, maybe you touched upon that earlier, but uh, maybe I missed it, but, but sort of manic ideologies, things that don't exist now, new religions, fundamentalisms. Didn't, I didn't see that arise somewhere. Um, and I just wanted, coming out of the data, whether you could predict anything um, that is not yet on the cards. Yeah, I think um, I hinted at it in the bio, biohazard area. I think it is absolutely the case that the power of individuals uh, and with it uh, crazy or fundamental or whatever individuals to shape the future of the world is getting bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. And the ability of nation states to manage that uh, is getting smaller over time with that. And so I think there is the power that uh, people will be able to create absolute mayhem uh, in the future. And uh, that, you know, some of the new medical technologies like DNA synthesizers to create a new smallpox or pathogen, for example, these options are beginning 
uh, to be on the horizon. And so I think there, there is a danger, and of course growing inequality might feed into that. So one of the most difficult institutional challenges is how do, in the super society, how do you manage uh, those individual risks which can topple the system? I think it's a, it, it's a very, very real danger. The lady here, and then I'm going to swing back this way. Yep. You raised an interesting issue about ethics in yeah. your talk. And I was just wondering, how do you reconcile science ethics and research independence? Uh, should science wait for ethics to approve the research projects? Or should ethics come after? How do we reconcile it? Yeah, this is a discussion we're having all the time uh, in Oxford and happens in all the, all the research communities, is the relationship between these. Um, and scientists like to tell you that, you know, uh, if there's a water uh, coming out of a dike, they will put their fingers in it. Um, but the, the inquisitive mind, the, the, that's what they do, uh, and it's very difficult to regulate. The, the, what we're trying to understand is the social implications of this uh, and the regulatory implications. So the scientists are pursuing their work, and then we have with them uh, very strong teams of ethicists, practical ethicists, philosophers and others that are working with them to try and look at some of the social ramifications and also with lawyers, the legal and regulatory ramifications. So it's, a, it's an interchange rather than a disciplining thing. Uh, a very difficult question going forward as a scientific ability broadens across the whole world and the machinery and technology to create team, clean rooms and to do things broadens across the whole world is if society decides that some things are unacceptable how do you how, who will who will police that and how do you stop rogue scientists or rogue societies doing what other scientists know to be unethical or downright very dangerous. So that is a very, very big issue of the future. And this goes back to this global governance question. I think that's going to be one of the biggest global governance challenges of the future. Okay. Uh, Ian, um, I, I think the next folks to uh, sit in this room are, are from Santa Fe Institute, and they'll talk about complexity, so I'm soon way away from <laughs> my pay grade. But, um, I mean, how, I, mean I, I regard God and nature as the ultimate tinkerer. And it seems to me a major premise of your, particularly your concluding thoughts, is to rely heavily on intentionality, of human intentionality, to somehow get in front of these disruptive changes that are hard to foresee. And I, I just in, in the discourse that I know you're engaged in, if nature works by basically, in the face of, ad, of disequilibrium, coming up with many mutations, a few of which are adaptive. Why are, you know, how far do we, to, to what extent do we bank on human intentionality to solve for what often in nature is just handled in real time as stuff happens and we deal? Getting back to one of the first questions you had. Yeah, there, there, there is a view that um, there's some natural disequilibrium, as it were, amongst humanity, and let's say 10% of us will die every 10 years from calamities of various forms. Uh, and that's just the process and it will carry on. I think that's wrong. Um, I think it's wrong historically and I think it's wrong going forward. I think that we have a responsibility uh, to overcome poverty on, on the, the planet. I think we have a responsibility to improve the quality of life of our fellow human beings. Um, and that, that responsibility should drive us as we have the means to ensure that everyone is included. And inclusive globalization for me is an essential form of the future. And so um, it may be that that's not what's going to happen and that actually we get into this fragmented, divided world with very different and increasing inequality and standards of living. I think that's a realistic outcome. But I think that's also a much, much more unstable world. And I think the problem with the 21st century risks, unlike the previous, in no previous century did an individual or group of individuals have the power to destroy humanity. Um, of course, since the bombs were developed in the 40, 30s and 40s, we could, nation states could destroy humanity. But they were assured of mutually assured destruction. It's very different when people want to destroy themselves and humanity. Uh, for all sorts of reasons. And I think that is a different, I think it's a crucial dividing line. Also what's different is the systemic risk. This interdependence means that a pandemic in Latin America is no longer, a, or in Europe, is no longer the Spanish flu. It's the global flu. Uh, so we don't, so the orders of magnitude of risk are going to change and I don't think we have the 
luxury as a species anymore to say, well, we have a natural, if you want to call it kill rate or churn rate. I think, it, I think we're in some different, very different game in the 21st century. It was more to say that clearly what <coughs> We have, to, we have to move much more quickly to be able to keep up with the growing complexity, if that's what you're pointing to. Okay, the gentleman next to you. I don't know where we're running out of time. We are at the same time a species of uh, pioneers, and until now, some of our best moments were the moments when we had to go somewhere and be the pioneers. Mm. One of my worries is that we have discovered America several times already, and there are relatively little places on the earth where we can be pioneers. What are the future goals where we can be pioneers? Not that it will overcome us, that uh, we will live longer or we will cure them, but which are, which are the, the frontiers where we can be pioneers in this century? Well, I, I think Should if... we go on Mars? Well, which is a very serious <laughs> question, by the way. Yeah, I, I, I think... I mean, there are obviously people who, who are thinking about that and trying to, and putting serious money into it, like SpaceX. Um, I don't think that that's the answer. I mean, it'll never be the answer for anyone except those that have $50 million or something. Um, and uh, I, I, I think our pioneering mission uh, should be to create a, a world where everyone can have the lives that we would aspire to. Uh, in terms of the quality of life, uh, the quality of the environment, uh, and so on, what the Chinese would call harmonious society. Uh, so uh, I think that is the point. If we can achieve that, we will achieve what humanity has never ever achieved in its history. So that would have been that's the most amazing pioneering achievement. Uh, I'm being told by the organisers it's time, right? <laughs> Do we have time for one or two more questions? Huh? Um, Oh, I'm in your hands. All right. One, three quick questions, three quick answers, and then we have to get out of here. <laughs> All right. Uh, the person next to you. Uh, question about systemic risk. Yep. Um, traditionally, the way to reduce systemic risk is to introduce redundancy into the system, yep. which of course yep. introduces inefficiency. Yep. How, yep. how might we pay for that inefficiency? Yep. Uh, extremely important point, which I forgot to mention, is one of the things that happened is that man management techniques, down to the front, um, management techniques just-in-time systems. The whole trend of valuing assets as capital across the board, stocks as assets, wasted stocks, wasted assets, um, has greatly increased the fragility of the system. Uh, and that's true in banking, it's true in manufacturing, and it's true in services like health. How many oxygen bottles you have in your hospital has been greatly reduced because it's wasted assets. You've got to sweat all your assets across the system. That has greatly increased the systemic risk. So redundancy is, is a bad word in management speak. Uh, that is a major problem for any systems management. And so bringing back uh, redundancies, one of the things we're trying to do is learn from natural systems. Uh, and one of the lessons we can learn from natural systems about redundancies is, is absolutely key. Uh, I don't think there's a shadow of doubt that um, wherever one is, in, uh, wherever one happens to be in the world, the television uh, is a tremendous uh, dispenser of violence. Uh, within an hour, uh, it's not difficult to see 12 shootings and so on and so forth, wherever one is in the world, whenever. Now, this is not a small matter, because it very quickly translates to action in the street among the kids and violence. Yep. And violence and fear of violence becomes uh, a place, a thing that makes the world unhappy. And in fact, uh, and pessimism enters into our thinking, uh, and violence being success in a lot of people's minds. And this is just the world that our friend on my right uh, was, was trying to counter by saying, taking a happy view. Now, this is a very serious matter. And it seems that the governments of the world are unable to do anything about the violence which is portrayed yep, in the media yep. all the time. Yep. And and uh, if you have kids on vi video games, uh, so um, very quickly, you. Uh, I agree. I don't have an answer. <laughs> yeah, well, is your view that the Chinese system of governance is better set up to deal with these long-term scientific breakthroughs uh, than Western governments? Oof, that, that, that is a difficult uh, question. I, I, I think it's better set up to deal with some of the long-term systemic challenges because of the nature of long-term thinking, uh, but whether it has the power to lift innovation 
uh, which requires venture capital, deep capital markets, liquid capital markets, uh, compared to, say, Silicon Valley, I would, at this stage, doubt. I think it will have in the future. You were last. Yeah, quick question. Uh, so, you know, putting aside the end of the parallel index, what about the end of just the regular index, given human suggestions? Yeah, to yeah. I, I think, I mean, the, the big issue is that as we move into this world of genetic manipulation and other things, the sorts of things we see now with sport in drug testing in the Tour de France or in the Olympics will be absolutely trivial. Okay? You saw the mouse. What does it mean for the Olympics? That's right. Uh, and so I think we will be in a, at least in a very different regulatory structure, uh, if not others. But maybe we'll be racing different genetic mutations against each other. Uh, yeah. Thanks for your attendance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.